Um, hello and welcome again to AS for Architecture. I'm talking to Liam Gillick. Liam, would you be so kind as to introduce yourself? Yes, my name's Liam Gillick. I am an artist, um, or trying to be one, or becoming one. Um, uh, I studied at art school, uh, much to the, well, my parents were actually fine about it, but I thought they'd be really upset because I was going to do a proper professional degree, like a, like an architect would do. But I, like, I was going to study law and um, and philosophy, but changed my mind at the last minute. And um, I've carried on ever since. And we are, Ambrose and I are related to each other. <laughs> we are. We are indeed very related. Um, <laughs> More related, I think, as the years go by, strangely enough. Um, so I wanted, when we started talking about this, doing this recording, you, your immediate suggestion was to talk about Cardross, St. Peter's Seminary in Cardross by Gillespie Kidd and Coyer, which I've been to a number of times. I've broken through the fence a number of times with my wife and my children because it's, cut, you know, it's, and I guess we could perhaps talk about why you wanted to talk about that and then go on to this further discussion, this point that you raised about talking about concrete formwork. Mm -hmm. So why Card Ross? Um, I'm a bit older than you and I remember these kind of buildings being built. And I remember seeing the, um, the concrete shell emerging or the, 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 the uh, the particular kind of bulk of what people tend to call brutalist buildings, which I never really like that term because I think it's too all-encompassing and it's become a sort of hipster sort of meme. I, I've always noticed the difference between buildings made of concrete. <laughs> I can tell the difference between one and the other. And often um, it was very clear quite early on that some of these sites, um, were strangely vulnerable. There's a kind of poignant vulnerability about them, even close to the time of their first construction, due to things I'm not sure, maybe you might be able to work it out, but particularly that site, um, it, it, it actually gives me this sort of visceral yearning or something like when I look at the old footage of the, um, of the students, I guess we could call them, um, the seminarians, um, going about their business and using it. There's something, I also find a similar thing when you see footage of a shopping center or a car park with people using it, that then it's like, it's a complicated issue, right? Mm. It's also to me to do with the, the, the relationships. I think the, the, the problem is, and maybe you could talk about this a bit more, the classic, the two classic ideals that I grew up with, which I guess are sort of very simplistic in your terms, but sort of Corbusian and Miesian, that in the sense that one is the glass and one is the, in a way, the, the form or the concrete. Um, there's something about the placement of these kind of buildings that for me, it's something to do with, where the concrete and the wood meet, or where the concrete and the glass meet, or where the the form and the and the landscape meet, this is where I find the kind of stupidity of the whole thing, in a way, or the lumpen, literally lumpenness, but also the sort of um, something about a failed enterprise, in a way, that's incredibly moving. You know, like when you encounter a big ship mm. or a big old station mm. that's been. It's a bit more complicated than that, though. It's, it's, interesting, it, it's interesting that you've talked specifically, you've compared it specifically to machines. And my interpretation of that movement in architecture, that mass concrete movement, which you're, I think you're right in saying brutalism is a, is a really unfortunate hipster meme. Um, but you've, re you've, you've reflected on it in relation to machines or buildings for machines. So there's your Corbusier there. <laughs> so you're a Corbusian, really. Um, whereas I always compared them to, 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 they always strike me as being very much to do with nature. 
um, their volume and their scale and their their they have this monolithic quality about them, which I find even where I find them inappropriate, I find them extremely moving in that way. Yeah, maybe and, that's what I meant, and I just couldn't put it in in the right words because I keep coming down to this sort of um, human issue, mm. which of course was what was used constantly to attack a building like that, that it was inhuman or it was cold or it was indifferent to, to uh, subjectivity or the human subject. And that's of course why I find it interesting considering the, 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 the um, I never know how to pronounce it correctly, the, the, the building in Scotland, um, that actually because it's a site of, in a sense, discipline, or of learning or of a certain mm. kind of set of procedures and rituals and rehearsal and practice, daily practice, right? Yeah. It, it lends it even more of a of a of a particular sort of um, I find it moving. And maybe yeah. it's similar to what you're talking about. I'm just looking at it from the other perspective. Yeah. From the side of the, the human individual in this in this place. What I'm curious about, um, is you said you'd been there. So how does it emerge out of the, the, the landscape? Do you come down to it or do you come up to it or across or through the trees? Well, it, you come through the trees because it's been mothballed for so long, because it was almost failing before it was finished as a, as a kind of social enterprise. The, the seminary, I do believe the Scots College in Rome was opened um, and all their seminarians were shifted out there before it was even finished. So it was, it was, as you say, a failed enterprise, which gives it, and those photographs and films of its opening are, as you say, extremely moving. It's sort of that, um, more broadly, that, that liturgical quality of, of all human activity. It's like they've put that, the, what, G, what Gillespie Kidd and Coyer did is they framed the liturgy, the, the, the Catholic liturgy, but also framed the liturgical kind of idea of, of gathering. So there's, a, as I say, for me, there's that, you mentioned Stonehenge before we started recording. There's a Stonehenge-like quality about it, which I mean is obviously intentional, but there's a, but, but Stonehenge in its production as well as in its, um, is it, in its aesthetic form. So I, yeah, I, you, you come through the trees, and then you're confronted by this enormous, because it's all overgrown, you're confronted by this tall, spiked metal, very, very durable fence. And, um, and then you, if you walk around the boundary, so I took my little tiny children in there. I think I had three children at the time. And uh, the youngest was probably in a sling. And we found a gap in the frame in the, and we squeezed through. And then the building is shattered, absolutely shattered. But with this, it's like a leviathan, this skeleton that sat there. Um, and the level of fero the ferocity of the destruction in there is quite something else. And I think that that pertains to some, this thing that you, you mentioned, that the public perception of this form of architecture is, a, I think, is curated for a start by certain people and leads to a wildness. I mean, the, the, the altar, for example, is, is sort of three foot of stone and has been, and you know, 15 feet across and four feet deep. It's been snapped in half. I have no idea it's how. It's a challenge, right? So it's, it's you know, I, I've had my moments as a young person of um, a feeling of, you know, the, the being confronting, like taking on a bus shelter is one of the great <laughs> things in life you know and they've you know they they used to be less um fragile <laughs> they didn't shatter as easily in the 1970s they were made of like plywood which yeah. is incredibly difficult to do anything with you can't <laughs> punch it out i've tried and when you punch plywood you just hurt yourself and there's something about that particular um <clears throat> it's a kind of challenge in a strange way mm -hmm. which and i think it's often misread I don't, I'm not always convinced that the, that the aim is to actually, you know, it's difficult talking about 
vandalism and breaking things? It's a very hard, I think it's a rather complicated question. I don't think it's ever really simple. Mm. And certainly in a situation like that, you've got this double issue. Not only was it a brutalist building, but it's also part of one of the great religions, global religions. So you've got this double kind of um, uh, evil in a sense, or double sort of breaking of, of um, uh, shattering of, of literally shattering a concept and a, and a place at the same time, hmm. which is just too tempting. There's also something incredibly idiotic about breaking an altar. It's, in, it's, a, it's, a, it's a sort of profound, it's a sort of thing from the Old Testament, something, mm. you know, the altar shattering and the golden calf kind of, you know, or something like that. It's such a, a massive thing to do when you're basically a kind of 15-year-old hoodie and you've got the same abilities as, you know, an Old Testament yeah. <laughs> God of some sort. <laughs> yeah, I, the, the other thing is the place is absolutely covered in satanic um, or Satanist um, insignia. Yeah. yeah. And, and some, some really deeply alarming stuff, like stuff that you wouldn't, when, when we you know, turn around a corner or climb up a broken staircase and find some you know, pretty alarming thing. So there is that, there is that quality about it as well. But, but, the, but I I, to go back to what you said at the beginning, this idea of the joining, the wood and the concrete, or the, or the building and the ground, there is a, there's a delicacy about that, about, our, about concrete specifically. It's, uh, it creates this juxtaposition, almost inevitably, which I've, I find, um, well, it's very architectural, but it's very, um, it's very aesthetic concrete in a, in a peculiar kind of way. Yeah, but I think I know why, because it, 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 even if you don't know anything about building anything, you're pretty, unless you're a total idiot, you know that if you build something out of concrete, if you decide to change where the door is or the window, it can be done, but it's a major pain in the ass. Mm -hmm. So you, there's something about the fact that those things are kind of, you're stuck with them where they are, mm. right? And, or at the same time, the decision to place an opening or a window in that position is um, considered in a way that's different when you do it within a framework or within a, another kind of built structure, right? So you have a certain freedom of where you place the openings that you don't have when you build with traditional brick and framing and whatnot, or even steel. Um, but there's something, again, that comes back to this sort of yearning and strange pain that these buildings sometimes give me, especially that one, mm. um, to do with the fact that, that, that that's, you're kind of stuck with those. And there's something profound about that meeting of the wood and the concrete or the framing out mm. of the windows and the doors and so on. And as you see in th those buildings, although it also happens in other ones, um, you can also see where there's, they've had to allow for certain tolerances, right? So the framing might be different or there's a series of openings within one big opening. It becomes a whole other articulation in its, in its own right on the facade. Like mm. in, in London, the, the story was always at the Barbican that they, they got the windows the wrong size. So they were all sort of packed out around, they don't sit comfortably against the concrete. There's a kind of, um, there's often a strange, you know, the, the elegant joins you can get within contemporary um, digital architecture are, are very relatively hard or were traditionally hard to achieve. Mm. Certainly in the 60s and 70s when these buildings are fairly, pretty much built by hand, you mm. know, a lot of them. Yeah, the um the word you use the word discipline, and I think that's quite an interesting one. These disciplinary spaces, and I think it's interesting that the the way that you're talking about the precision required in in using concrete is extremely disciplinary. You, you know, you use wood and you use bricks, and a man with a chisel and a hammer can chop it up and and amend. You cast a building, and that's it. It's cast. So there's a kind of precision in the way that the architect has to operate at that point. And then the builder has to be required to operate, which I think is quite, which is quite interesting. The, um... yeah, but there's also kind of a shame about it in a strange way. Like in, in Northeast America, 
where most of the vernacular building is wood. Um, almost all the houses have concrete basements, new ones, and even quite old ones, certainly for the last 30 or 40 years. And I always ask people, why don't you just keep going? Mm -hmm. And their reply, the, the contractors I spoke to always said, well, we don't feel we're as good. We, we, we don't really do concrete that you'd want to see, mm. things like that. So there's, that's, but that's another question we can come to later on. Yeah, I am. Um, but I also like this idea that, you know, they, the Catholic Church take on um, Gillespie, Kidd and Coyer, who are early, earlier in the 20th century through Jack Coyer. But the actual two architects that they use to produce this concrete architecture are um, one's Jewish, Izzy Metzstein, and the other's an atheist. And I think that's, that's always fascinated me as well that they were very good. And my favorite church of theirs is St. Patrick's Kilsyth, which is an extraordinarily handsome um, sort of piece of nature. It's a force of nature. It's like a volcanic plug that's come out of the ground. Absolutely. And with this beautiful sculptural roof and these deep, deep, thick walls. Is that but, the one that had the tower? No, oh. that's, that's the more famous um, St. Bride's and East Kilbride. Right, right which is also amazing, but, but towerless, as you say. Um, but I actually think that the, the, the way that the roof sits on um, St. Um, St. Um, Peter's, not St. Peter's, um, St. Patrick's, um, is, is, is quite extraordinary. It's virtuosic. But the way that the, the church adopts these two guys who aren't within the club, so to speak, and in a way gets them to create things that talks about the absolutism of their own position. So they take on two, two, two uh, architects to produce an absolutist architecture. Yeah. And, they, and they do it better than, almost better than anybody, almost better than Corbusier himself. Which is quite amazing. It's a lovely thing. But why, so, so you then asked me, suggested to me that we should talk about casting, mm -hmm. the casting of concrete. Yeah. And I raised this question, it's sort of, your work is not concretey. It's no, very, absolutely. it's very mu much the opposite of concrete. You know, if you were Rachel White, Reed would say, "Well, that's obvious." But so why, it's why? To with, it's to do with production. I'm always much more interested in production than consumption. I think one of the problems about how we understand art in the last, in, in its kind of um, uh, increasingly sort of subjective, sort of post postmodern. Uh, decadent and late phases, we could call them, is that, you know, most people think, well, okay, at least in here is some kind of critique of consumption or critique of art or something, right? So from Andy Warhol to Jeff Koons and whatnot, you get a double hit. So if you're rich and got more money than sense, you can buy a big Jeff Koons, but you can also say it's a kind of critique of luxury and a critique of consumption. I'm from a different kind of um, line, which also goes back, ironically, in terms of naming, to like Art Concrete, as it was called, and Letterism, which then became Fluxus, which then became Conceptual Art, which is a, something that's much more to do, it's much more of a post-war in the European sense, sense of like the impossibility of doing anything, and mm -hmm. looking at processes of production rather than uh, looking at the, at the more um, uh, mercantile aspect of cultural exchange, right? So um, how could I put that in a, in, a, in a better way? Well, it means that one of the things that really struck me when I came to America is that the building trade here is highly unionized in a way that it's not any longer in Britain or in other mm -hmm. parts of Europe. So I, I like to watch things <laughs> being built. I find it interesting mm. and I realized they were using carpenters to build the forms for modern buildings contemporary buildings the amount of hands-on carpentry involved was extraordinary and the more you move out to Brooklyn and Queens and whatnot whole modest buildings are entirely knocked up with hand-built formwork mm. and so I became interested in this job of the which do collapse sometimes it's quite high it appears anecdotally there's quite a high number of 
work construction industry injuries here if you read every now and then about a whole concrete slab collapsing in brooklyn and it's being done by a bunch of guys who just turned up in america and know how to like nail gun together bits of plywood mm -hmm. and um it's more about that so that's the contemporary side right the interest in the form as as a part of a flow of production this kind of negative craft as it were which um is often the, the worst paid unless you're in the union then it's very highly paid very slow but it's it works on two extremes mm -hmm. right so what you really are watching here is a kind of craft taking place right and that's the key to my interest my initial interest um i could go on but i think that's really a really amazing kind of insight i <clears throat> i've been thinking and reading about your work a bit and I'll, we'll get on to that i think a bit more but this idea of the impossibility of doing anything can you explain that a little bit more i mean in this is just in terms of the art world but is it also in terms do you think that there is do you think that there's a relationship to architecture i mean in that i'm going to call it a poem that you wrote hmm. um should be you say there should be an increasing skepticism about architecture as an independent discipline. So I'm guessing that if there is an impossibility of doing anything in art, it's also true of architecture. Yeah, I would say so. I mean, the difference is that it, it operates with a different economic model, right? So I work with architects a lot, architects who, who build things, right? Because yeah. if I'm invited to get involved with a new building or whatnot, I have to deal often not with the name on the top of the on the top of the headed paper, but maybe couple down in the list, the actual architect does all the work. Yeah. And um, so coming back to what you're saying, it means that um, I'm very aware that their economy is very different to mine. Mm -hmm. I will tend at one point, if things go well, I will get one lump of money that relates to the exchange of one thing that adorns or decorates or sits alongside this building they're getting paid they're billing people um, for various tasks and various hours so i become very um what happens is, is i'll often meet and in and work alongside an architect where we both find some weird space slightly outside of these two extremes of how we exist right another kind of discussion it seems odd to talk about how you get paid or or, and so on, but it so affects how you do things. Like the presentation as an idea is something that's so painful for me and so difficult, but it's so crucial to a contemporary, um, uh, you know, active architect who's building, right? The, the presentation of the thing, the exchange with the client and so on. The whole, all of these power relationships are almost inverse of what mine would be normally. In, a, in the same situation where the architect might have to go through a number of blocks or barriers before getting to the person actually paying the bills at the end, I unless they're doing a private house or a very special or they're very high level kind of architect, um, I'm often only talking to the very highest person in the pyramid because mm -hmm. they feel grand. They want to talk to an artist, right? So this seems a very roundabout way of talking about things. Um, to get back to this point about architecture, it doesn't take long in almost any project for it to become very clear where architects are dissatisfied with the limits of what they can do and where the, 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 the uh, hierarchy of architecture and where the, the payment, um, the billing process, the client relationships, all of these things are very tricky, mm -hmm. right? But I'm also aware <laughs> on the other side that when you get to a kind of um, uh, what used to be called paper architecture, when you get to a kind of theoretical architecture and that the, like I just went to the architecture Biennale in Venice, right? The claims therefore that are being made that are not about knocking up a building in Seoul or in Hemel Hempstead are now so far off that it's it's almost ridiculous that you know they're 
it, it's a kind of another another discourse entirely. It barely relates to actually doing anything. Mm. So what am I saying? I'm saying it's more it's it's more of a general reminder, right? More than a it should be not there has to be. It's mm -hmm. not a it's like an anti manifesto written by a, a relativistic postmodernist in a way, like and telling the truth instead of pretending to be from an earlier utopian moment. But I think it's a truth that relativism is a self, sort of truth that's that's appropriate for now, where we do have these incredibly dispersed uh, uh, supply chains where we have the, where the money for something is is coming from nowhere near where it's being done, where you know uh, cultural and intellectual capital is incredibly um, mutable and complex and imploded and whatnot. So it's more like that. That's what I'm talking about. It, it's not, I wouldn't suggest, for example, you know, people would then say, well, why not? Why don't you set up an interdisciplinary school of whatever? But I'm not even sure you can do that now, effectively. Um, I, I, I would tend, I would tend to, uh, reluctantly, I would tend to agree with you. I've been doing what's what we know because interdisciplinary is so last year liam it's uh <laughs> it's all about trans transdisciplinarity now of course um it's all about transdisciplinarity and the, and and actually what i'm discovering in doing that is that the methodological um journey is the research so it's like it's almost as you, you called it, you're the only other person I've ever heard call it post postmodern. I don't read very much, so maybe it's a general term, but it's almost post postmodern in that you end up thinking predominant. So you go and do transdisciplinary research, which is ostensibly to do with social justice. And actually, what you write about is yourself doing transdisciplinary research and the way yes, that it because, was different. Yeah, I think I know why, because that Dave, a guy called Dave Beach, wrote an incredibly big and very different laborious book to read called Art and Value. And he tried to actually write about um, uh, production rather than mm -hmm. consumption. And it gets very complicated, but it's a really great book. It's really about economics. And um, yeah, he's really talking about the victory of what some people call Western Marxism, which is basically Frankfurt School mm -hmm. Marxism and Freudianism, which basically it's very hard. The classic postmodern theorists, the French ones mainly, were basically communists and mm. quite, they were writing postmodern theory in order to find new ways to extend the life of a kind of communist Marxist practice, an actual way of life. And mm make it work like it was an, an attempt to understand the way the way um capitalism was mutating right with with new flows of information the way in because of technology developing in a different speed to the way analysis of technology develops right so mm. they're trying to understand new forms of communication new forms of media they're trying to come up with an answer to that that can still mean you end up with a kind of marxist life and a marxist mm. and communist way and the Italians do it in a very particular way. They come up with this operist idea, looking at labor and the withdrawal of labor as an idea. The thing is, as this kind of has gone on, you know, I was still alive. These people are all still alive and still writing when I was a student, like Lyotard and Deleuze and all these people, Baudrillard, there was their peak period. Um, basically, Western Marxism and Freudianism is one, which is much more about taste, manners, pseudo ethics. Um, individual relationships, um, identity, these were all fascinating and all important things, right? But they lack this kind of, um, let's say, not, let's not say political, but say ideological underpinning that's very clear, that's very like straightforward. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Um, yeah. And I'm not necessarily against it. You know, I, there's nothing more boring than listening to a, let's, with all due respect, like a, Alain Badiou on a bad day is not something you really want to sit through because it's so tortured and so difficult. But um, I think that we're living in very optimistic times to a certain extent and, and very exciting 
times to be a young person. Um, but it is also complicated when you then try and work out what should be done and yeah. what should be built and what is an ethic of postmodernism. What is the morality of contemporary architecture? Mm. It, it becomes very, should there even be one, right? Or aren't, you know, these questions have been piled onto art and onto architecture in a way that historically speaking, in my opinion, there were other structures that were agonizing over these questions, right? Maybe religions, maybe yeah. um, political systems, right? If you look at the architecture Biennale in Venice, it's really fascinating that the claims made for what the projects are about and what they can do are so enormous that no one, very few people even in the 20th century would have had the hubris to claim that their information room could actually do anything about Look, you know, uh, migration, I, I, uh, climate change, climate emergency and whatnot. It's really fascinating. I mean, I did. I, so uh, in 2018, I, I was um, the co-designer of the Scottish collateral project at the architecture of Biennale, essentially a pavilion uh, at Indusaduro. We, we, uh, we, that was the space yeah. that we could get. And it was, it was great, but the claims we had to make, we made a giant timber play frame that was sort of referencing the uh, alleyways and the water. And, and it was great fun and it worked really well. Um, five and a half tons of timber and 9,000 screws, which I lifted with my own spare um, on, a, on a diet of coffee, cigarettes and Prosecco. And, uh, uh, but, but we made these extraordinary, we had to make these extraordinary claims, particularly after the event. So there was a, a whole process, two year process of post rationalization, which we could claim in a way was um, analysis. But really, as you say, was loading a very simple thing, which was very good. It was a great play frame. But we loaded it with, and, and I'm really good at this. This is what I. This is my favourite game, with a kind of uh, morality, I suppose, is the word. Because I think I think we do have to come back to what w the question of why art and architecture are having having these demands made of them now. They were in the post-war period as well. They were, you know, architecture particularly was an ethical endeavor and it's re it retreated from that as ethics retreated from the public sphere, as far as I could, as I read it from a historical perspective in the, um, in the Thatcher Reagan years, where there's a kind of retreat from. Oh yeah. And that's what the efficacy of This is what I was talking about at the beginning. When, this is why I wanted to come into this through through concrete, as it were, because there's something very determined about the building of structures out of concrete on behalf of the people or mm -hmm. the congregation or the or the the, the whatever the, the, the group, um, which shows a like we're making that this is going to be different. This is public, this is a kind of literally a concrete gesture of a new beginning, right? Mm. A new uh post-war beginning and you know my friend who died yesterday was born in 1942 right so these people are now dying right people born just before or during the second world war in europe i'm being very eurocentric in this case um but it's what i know right um uh what happens in art and in architecture for quite a long time after that period is you have this problem of how can you proceed after this century or during this bloody brutal century of incredibly efficient uh, mass murder mm -hmm. on every side in a way. And that affects everything um, that's being done. It even keeps going through to the eighties and through the beginning of Thatcher Reagan period because what happens there is you start to get the emergence of a new, new kind of art. I'm talking here about, you know, art. Let's we could call it advanced art, art where it's mainly for people who think about art a lot, right? You know, it's what what a specialized world. It, it's like the study of the question of what is art is basically what contemporary art is. Like, what could be art today? 
which is again another kind of big moral or ethical <laughs> demand that is kind of ludicrous. Um, uh, so where am I? Well, what's the point of all this? Um, it has probably that those tenuous threads, which also, also affect all of the postmodern writers and all of the uh, Deleuze's and Lacan's and all your yeah, architectural theorists and even people like Rainer Bannum and all this kind of stuff. That's all, it, it's kind of, it's hanging by a thread, that memory. Hmm. But it did affect what you think you're doing. Germany, you still have it. There's still a very strong um, kind of connection to the idea that anything you do in art other than demonstrate the failure of art is a kind of posturing delusion, right? Mm -hmm. So any kind of good community project, any kind of happy sort of semi-serious enlightening project is pointless because as in there's no poetry after Auschwitz, right? So mm -hmm. there's, it's not possible. That still remains in Germany, but that's also connected to their history and art anyway. Um, sorry, I'm rambling. No, 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 not at all. I, I... But it led me to another thing, an idea I wanted to kind of push back at you. So sometimes when I'm in, when you're dealing with actually what gets built, right, which is often rather pragmatic actually mm -hmm. nowadays, right, in almost direct opposition to the rather grand claims on the other hand, um, uh, I sometimes think we're in a kind of like a Baroque Dark Ages, you know, meaning that when you look at like an at 8th century or 7th century church or something with, I don't know what you call that. Is that the Dark Ages? Romanesque? No, what is that? The Dark Ages from 450 to 1450, isn't it? Those were the days. <laughs> no inflation. You know, a beer was half a groat for 400 years. <laughs> every book, every foot, you, you, you read chapter 27 of Capital by Marx. <laughs> he, he waxes lyrical about it. He, he loves that stuff. Every freeborn man gets four acres of land and tuberculosis. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, but it's something like, and the Baroque bit that's not visible, right, today is actually all that convoluted thinking mm. that surrounds everything. So you basically look at another system mm. built structure with the green roof which you can do a lot with because you can decorate the paneling and you can kind of glaze it in complicated ways. But essentially it's a kind of, it's a sort of, it ain't going any, you know, it's not, nothing's really developing in a certain way. Um, or it's got a certain kind of asceticism about it or a certain kind of, there's a hard to place good taste that's got something to do with modernism, but not really anything to do with it. Um, that meets kind of, a, a, an invisible baroque wave of like conceptual thinking that is clearly not evidenced in the structure and it's really fascinating i find that's, it really a, that's an that's an amazingly interesting idea i um i was thinking about that in relation to something else today about the the well i was i mean it, it comes back to this idea of formwork doesn't it Art formwork being the ghost of as i put it in our email um the ghost architecture, the thing that sits around it. And we have this kind of, as we've moved into the world of words, which we, the world of words and world, world of images, but particularly words, um, that's where the detail is now. That's where the ornament is. And we leave the other bit behind. I mean, Venturi and Scott Brown's excellent book, Learning from Las Vegas. They talk about the decorated, the duck of the decorated shed, and we're in the world of the decorated shed, where the yeah the 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 rhetoric and the um, verbiage around it. So so you judge the building on whether the verbiage is quality verbiage, like you would look at a baroque building and say, well, he got his scrolls and his triglyphs and metopes right, or didn't, and therefore it's shit baroque. Yeah. I th <laughs> well, I mean, yes, it sounds, you know, um, it's interesting because I read that book as a student and mm -hmm. at art school, I read all these books and the, what's it called? There's the Hitchcock International Modernism uh -huh. book, the Philip Johnson and Hitchcock, or whatever it's called. The, um, I read all these books because I had this weird yearning and I'm much more interested in what we call applied art than art art. It's just operating in the world of applied arts was way too 
um, and craft, I guess you call it, it was way too uh, discipline specific. So art school seemed to be a place where you could operate to try and understand um, the built world, let's say, mm -hmm. which could include bus stops and could include clinics and could include um, uh, a seminary, right? Or a, or a um, contempt, you know, post-war ecclesiastical architecture. Mm -hmm. And you, you, you could talk about all these, or think about all these things as affecting, um, I was really wanting to, I, I wanted to see where is the, um, if it's unclear, if there's no common project, right? If there's no longer any ideology that will carry a, a 10 million Italians to vote communist or something, then what, where are, what is, what does affect us? Where, where can you read the kind of the, um, what are the sort of the semiotics of the built world? Mm. And I'm a sculptor essentially, so I make objects. So I make them in relation to this strange, um, the strange uh, shifts that happen and the deception that happens within language around what gets built and made in the world, not just buildings, but teaspoons and hi-fi systems and computers. And there's, I'm very influenced by an uh, Italian filmmaker called Nanni Moretti, and he made a film called Caro Diario in the early 80s, early 90s maybe even. And um, he basically, his whole film career kind of, he starts as the good Italian Marxist and gradually kind of turns into a, a sobbing, middle-aged sort of sentimental Italian in throughout his movie career. Um, and his main subjects become the church and the family and so on, having started with the revolution and why are we here. And the great middle point is Caro Diario, Dear Diary. And in that film, um, and with other films that he makes at that period, he's often picking people up on language. And he would be probably now closer to 70 than 60. So he's been more than 10 years older than me. And that's the battleground for them. The, the idea that we battle about language is not new. Of course, it's, it's eternal, but, but it's a very distinct battle that's going on during the 80s and the early 90s even about the emergence of this new language of kind of slippery deception that mm. we might think of as Blairite or something or the language of spin. This is happening... Um, he talks in an earlier film, which is 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 set in a during a water polo game where a, a guy has lost his memory, and during the during the water polo game, he attempts to remember who he is, and he realizes he's the communist mayor of a small town in Italy. But this kind of gradually comes out through the game, and it's actually a comedy, right? It's a great idea for a film, and during that film, it's which is a bit earlier, like in the eighties, he he distinctly upgrades people all the time because he's hearing this language for the first time because he's lost his memory. He's never yeah. heard people using this new um, language of development, projection, compromise, strategy. Um, these are the, this is the language I'm, I'm focusing on. Mm -hmm. The Dadaists were focusing on the sounds of the First World War and the sounds of people just being idiotic or the sounds of the asylum, right? My sounds are the smooth sounds of people trying to sell you back what you already owned or trying to tell you that, that if they stick some grass on a roof, they're going to save the planet and they should get 10 million back. You know, that kind of thing. I'm interested in this kind of, these coded languages. Yeah. Way. That's, um, so, so your work exists both as a written form and... Would you say you see yourself, your work as predominantly written? I mean, you, obviously you do a lot of making and there's a lot of, mm -hmm. you know, there's a lot of inf architecture. I put in that email to you that your work is architectural insofar as it's spatial and programmatic. Yes, and it relies on built structure in order yes. to have any meaning. Like it's no good if you take it out. Oh, it does kind of work, but if you, it's not like some people we know, some people related to you, who you could take out something they've made and stick it in, a, in the woods and it would still be good. Yeah. Mine's a bit, it would just be weird. So I wanted to get to this point. I've been thinking about this. So I've been pondering 
this idea of your do is your are your sculptures are your artworks intended because because I, i'm getting from what you're saying and from what you've written that you see your 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 role as an artist within if not actively and purpose of uh, purposefully yourself but within a kind of within an evolution of a a, 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 an ethical program like your your art your art is is fundamentally ethically orientated um, i don't want to use the word moral because it has connotations but 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 for example this this uh paper that you this essay that you wrote we lived and thought like pigs which is a fantastic essay and i've got to find that book that it's about because it just sounds amazing but you seem to be you seem to be kind of um, agitated by the way that the world, particularly the art world, has kind of instrumentalized, utilized goodwill, creativity, young people. So are you a justice orientated artist? Is that, is that, maybe that's the simple question. And is that because of this kind of interest in the ethical evolution of art and architecture over the last 70, 80, 90 years? I think it's partly that I'm fascinated by um, what are the conditions that occurred to permit something or to make something happen, right? Not, I find, you know, the, look, some people just, I, I like to, I've always, Let's make it very basic first. I've always made things and drawn a lot because I don't know, it makes things in my brain uh, feel better. I mean, it's good for you. I mean, it's good for me anyway, mm -hmm. um, and always was, even as a child. I thought everyone did it and they do because when you're a child, everyone keeps getting, giving you bits of paper because they think that's what children want or they should have, it's good for them. Um, but I had spent a lot of time drawing, also in a structural sense, right? As a young child, it's meaning I would draw whole buildings, but I would draw first the frame of the building and the foundations, and then I would draw, erase and draw on top at the age of like eight or something. I'd spend hours and hours building buildings and build every, draw every brick and do everything. And I would have these ongoing projects, these mega projects that I was working on. And I'd come back and in my head, I was building something but I was just doing it on paper and sort of drawing it out. But I was, there was actually a procedure of, I would bring in a, like a, a sort of a, a big blob on the paper, which I would gradually erase, would represent the concrete or the sand mm. or the mortar or something. And this was great fun. There was no, you know, there's nothing to watch on TV. And people didn't really like you watching TV at that point. They just thought it was bad for you which does turn out to be bad for you, actually. They finally did some real research. It was a small thing in The Guardian that TV does actually turn out to be bad for you. They did a sort of 50-year study. Um, who would have known it? Um, <laughs> anyhow. Is, so, it the co is it the content or the cathode ray? I think it's a bit of both. It's the sedentary thing. It's the sort of lack of exchange. It's this, I think they looked into like people with... The only way they could measure it was based on... Um, you know, uh, uh, things like dementia and so on, which of course mm. is very hard, it could be diet, it could be lots of things, but you know what? I'm not a scientist, but I bet you sitting around all day watching TV may have something to do with it. It seems likely, right? Um, so what's the point of this childhood story? Well, it means that I'm, it's not about being ethical or, or, or justice. It's like a genuine curiosity about what are the conditions that lead to something? Hmm. I was always fascinated by the day before. Yeah. Like I did a thing for the underground years ago, map. You know, they did get artists to do the tube map cover. It's the biggest publication I've ever done. They print like 1.2 million of them. And um, I dated, mine was just the date of the day before the first underground train ran, right? Yeah. So it's something like 25th of February, 1864, or 1865 is the day before. And I'm really fascinated by these points of, of uh, shift and these pivot points. And that's why I'm interested in that book, To Live 
and think like pigs because that guy tried to look at he tried to identify one moment it's a fiction in a way it's a kind of hysterical theory fiction which was at, at the the palace nightclub in paris in like 1979 where you get the final the first coming together of the new tech people the new vain people the bored vain jealous people the bankers and the good time people who just don't give a shit like the nihilists the contemporary nihilists and he proposes in that book a night of red and gold when all these people first come together and they set in, into play something that's almost impossible to defeat it's a it's a new world of narcissism and boredom yeah. and the two things together for this guy are like you'll never defeat them you know narcissism and boredom are very very hard to deal with on a on a massive scale you know yeah yeah so, that's what I'm interested in. It's like, so it, it seems hard to follow my point. So no, I, 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 can, I can see a very clear thread and it comes back to form work, doesn't it? Yes. It comes back to the idea. And, and you talked about it again, about this idea of process <laughs> over Kunzian ends where you have the day before the realization of the thing, the day before it's of the, the conception, there's a latent energy in the object, in the process, in the mind of the creator, be that the parent or the artist or whoever, which is really, I, really fascinating. I like, I, I'm lucky, I live in a city that's constantly being rebuilt, <clears throat> as most major cities are, because of so much excess money around it. The best thing to do is put it into a building, mm. probably. Um, uh, but what I really like is that first sound of the, the nail gun, which I've heard a few times, even around my own building, yeah. and it'll kind of wake me up. And it's the first man in the hole, often just one guy with a piece of wood going, -chunk. and that's the beginning. And they're starting to build the first rough formwork to pour the first bit of concrete for mm. the foundation layer. Or that because we it's so visible here because we build on rock in New York, right? Mm. So you can it's like a child's drawing. I'm back to my childhood drawing of mm. drawing a building where the rock is the bottom of the piece of paper. Mm. You just have to work up from it. But it's such an extraordinary thing to witness that beginning process of a guy standing there with a piece of paper and pacing out or getting a piece of string and then hammering a stake into the ground yeah and starting to nail gun bits of wood to it i don't know and there's I, something about that i still see that i see those ghosts at um uh st joseph's right is it or st peter's st peter's st peter's card yeah yeah in a way because you see it marked on the concrete you see yeah. the labor of the laborer as it were you do in the brick you do in the bricks behind you of course but it's a mm. different kind of thing Mm. It's a different, there's an art to pouring concrete, that's for sure, especially in a chic home in Maida Vale or something or in, in like uh, wherever, but you know, your everyday concrete, it's a guy with an agitator and a, a big truck fills it up, but you see still the traces of, of and the mistakes and the, the slip ups. So it's not, it's a very, um, it's a very humanist perspective, hmm. which is rather lovely. I think you you sound you come across as a extremely um, hopeful. This is a very hopeful thing to see the human hand in the um, in the work. I think that's yeah. But I you know I think it's not the problem is if you were born like I was in the mid sixties you were told pretty much by the time you could do anything that you'd missed all these moments yeah. where people thought i know let's organize ourselves into an international architectural committee and build better schools yeah and make houses for people living in southern italy and give them some dignity right yeah. that started to collapse almost immediately and yeah. fall apart as even as, as it was happening and my job 
only is an artist is I this is why it's a good thing for an artist to think about all I'm trying to do is to think about these things that are rather they're not fundamental they're secondary or they're primary or they come they're not primary they're secondary or they come just before or just after that's what an artist can do like a poet can talk about after the dawn or before or after the love affair or, or you know they can um you wouldn't I think talk about anything but it's like I'm not really interested in poetry I think it's a sort of failed form but contemporary form but I'm interested in it as a, as a way of life or a kind of way of addressing things in the world like of processing information or processing ideas I'm trying to contribute something which is connected to looking at connections that are uh, uh, normally they're often hiding an ideological um, aspect that to point at it directly would not help you right mm -hmm. and therefore I'm interested in, in a guy called Simon Critchley who wrote a book called The Ethics of Deconstruction where he tried to write about you know the ethics of deconstruction which is almost impossible because by its nature it ain't ethical it's a, just a process of deconstruction and of course in that book he talks about Levinas and he talks about these ideas it's really I can't tell you the story but because it's too complicated but this is the sort of thing I'm interested in and in the end it will be marginal i'm fascinated by marginalia literally marginalia i'm fascinated by by the anonymous artists of the middle ages the anonymous scribes the religious the people copying out the 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 holy books right in almost every great abrahamic religion that that what they leave in the margin what they practice mm. what they what they observe like they draw a, a, a sheaf of wheat or something and it's got not, not much to do with the text. That's what I'm doing. I'm continuing mm. the process. I'm on, I'm on an island somewhere and I'm just, don't know. Have you read the very, very wonderful novel, A Canticle for Leibovitz by a guy uh, called Arthur Miller? No, right. not Arthur Miller, Walter Miller. Right. Who was a bomber pilot or a bomber crewman in the bombing of Monte Cassino during the Second World War and he came out of it and wasn't very happy, I don't think. But he wrote a book about exactly that that thing, but set in the post-atomic age, so in a, in a kind of dystopian future world. And it's a very elegant piece of work. It's not like um, a lot of that kind of frenzied stuff. It's much more like Kurt Vonnegut, but, but literary. Um, and, and that's not a judgment to Kurt Vonnegut, who I adore as a writer but um but but it's about exactly that about them yeah looking at the looking at the um the edges the edges or the margins again these junctions between mm -hmm. absolute things and fragmentary things um so i felt guilty about this right as a student i'm sure you have students that feel guilty as hell that they don't have a position or that they don't have a, a vision or they're not a genius or they're not crazy they're just they can kind of see certain things, but they can't quite get their fingers on what it is. I basically spent the last 30 years trying to get my fingers on what that is that's kind of bugging me. Mm. You see what I mean? It's a very particular contemporary feeling, bugging, being bugged by something. <laughs> People are like, stop bugging me. Your children probably say it, you know? Stop looking at They're not quite old stop enough. I say it to them. I can still get they away will. with saying it to them, but they will, they, <laughs> yeah. they're, they're starting. They're starting down that, that, that pathway. But, but yes, it, yes, and I think, Sorry, I interrupted you. No, not at all. I I thought we might talk. One of the things that I've thought about with regards postmodernism is the is the idea of gaps and spaces. So you, you talked about language and the way that, you know, in that um, postmodernist way they start unpacking language and it all becomes a bit much and it's all a bit it's actually not very useful it's not very comfortable and it's not very like reality and it gets utilized and instrumentalized by neoliberalism and so on um because it's vulnerable if you posit a complex theory based on things barely hanging together where you've written a whole book about the concept of like difference or but even given it a new name this is incredibly it's like trying to build like a butterfly plane or something it's like it's hopeless so it's incredibly vulnerable to to ensure a kind of postmodern 
analysis could sustain itself um, takes a lot of mental energy and effort, like way more than most people have got. And you saw it in architecture. You would you have all these stages in a way of postmodern architecture that keep collapsing in on themselves and becoming parodies and becoming, mm. you know, the blob appears and it seems to be the answer. And that kind of becomes a sort of a type and it becomes horrific. And then you've got, you know, all these other things happen. And that's all I'm saying really about postmodernism. I think I think it's a very fine set of ideas to try and deal with the fact that technology is accelerating away from its critical double, right? So you can be pretty reliant on the fact, that's why I mentioned it earlier, talking about industrial buildings or whatnot in relation to, to concrete architecture, that, that the critical potential of modernism, meaning as a consciousness, like how do we make better public housing in 1925 in Germany, the trajectory of modernity and the trajectory of the thing that's sort of critiquing it or answering back is quite one-to-one -one in a way. Now it's so fucking far apart, you have no idea. I had a great, I sometimes go to the GSD in Harvard to do their reviews because they bring in outsiders. And there was this great woman a few years ago, and they were supposed to do something that re reflected climate change and the climate emergency and Duda and all the normal things. And she basically built what looked like a kind of Korean, um, you know, low density <laughs> apartment block. And I was like, what, what's that? And she's like, it's a kind of, it's, a, it's housing. And I said, so what else have you, I found this woman fascinating. And every single project she did, regardless of what the topic was supposed to be, <laughs> she built the same kind of Singapore gated community. It was fantastic. It was a kind of just the most radical person there. Yeah, for sure. Um, but but maybe she was the most postmodern. It's like, you know, um, yeah, yeah. But the, the, so this idea of yeah, because something that I've encountered or I've I've heard people talk about is Foucaultianism or Foucault and his head because your 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 sculptural installations they they function to other the spaces that they're in. They critique the, the gallery. So again, we're going back to this idea of the room before the artwork was in there. And I guess mm -hmm. the, 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 the sculpture, the, the artwork as something that you wrote about, you touched upon in the things that I read, was the idea of actually questioning the nature of the exhibition itself. And so your work functions to, uh, in a way, to use that modern phrase, other the building itself and other the space of the building itself. Is there something in there about, uh, have you been... You know, Foucaultian idea of heterotopias. Is this, is this at the heart of what you're kind of, of, of trying to, I suppose, in a way, generate spaces that, en that enable us to adopt multiple identities, but also critique the, mm -hmm. this, this, this kind of oil tanker of neoliberalism, which is just crushing. Yeah. I mean, the thing is, he's Foucault's so hardcore in a way, literally. I mean, it looks normal now to see this guy with like a bald head, totally shaved head and a leather jacket, like taking people apart during lectures. But it was pretty radical to look that way when he did. And he was a pretty, um, he was a pretty extreme human being in a good, maybe a good way. I don't know. Like he's a, a special case. And of course, he's fascinated by Nietzsche. So, but they all were like the French end up often, you know, there's a Nietzsche thing underlying all of this stuff. I think he's too strict for me. I'm much more, I'm much more like you say, without necessarily wanting to be, I'm much more linguistic or I'm much more interested in the word games of the, of some of the other people, mm. like who are almost seen now as, a, as like hopeless cases like Derrida and so on. But I still, because I'm interested in, we share a kind of, I guess it's culturally, culturally Catholic or culturally Celtic or some mishmash of like Scottish Irish Catholicism and literature and I felt it growing up a lot that use of language or the feeling of words can be can be played with or words can be um I mean a lot of people feel that but I, you realize you grow up not everyone feels like that right no, that, that, that's that's that to me a mystery as well yes. I, I, ca I can't I can't understand people who don't <laughs> 
a find pleasure in writing and b learn anything through doing it yeah but when i was first being published i would use words but in i wasn't trying to be like james joyce because i hadn't really read it properly or but i already it's such a it's got nothing to do with us anyway james joyce is part of some fancy damn dublin world we're like the people from the north and the you know we're more we're not nothing to do with Dublin literary people at all. I don't identify with them at all. But there's something in in writing. I I would use these words like I used the word spitified in a in an essay where I wrote when I was about 25 for a magazine. Spitified. 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 So they're like, what what's spitified mean? And I'm like, well, it's the feeling of sort of self-loathing that is generated by the break between like the stated intentions of something and what's actually results so if you look at something and they say it's about um i don't know um about neoliberal politics but what you're actually seeing is kind of a half-assed painting it, it creates a feeling of spitification where you've kind of got a fragment between a series of fragments trying to be stuck together so anyway they rejected that because they're like there's no such word so then I tried to use other words like I liked misled as a as a verb, like like misled, as in misled someone into thinking a certain way, or it was a misling, it was a misling proposition. <laughs> like the exhibition was misling, yeah, which yeah. means the condition of misleading on a on a kind of uh, fundamental level, ontological <laughs> level. Yeah, yeah. No, we we uh, we the one of the most successful games we ever developed has as a family was the um, made up word Scrabble because we were shite oh. at Scrabble. Yeah. But if you can make words up and then it's all about the negotiation of the word um, yes. and, and the justification of the word. And it's actually a much, you know, Scrabble is as boring as hell. So it actually makes a boring game quite good. But I just wanted to finish on one thing because I think I've taken enough of your time. This, this thing that you wrote, there should be citizen artists. I suppose I've, we've already talked about that, but what, what does a citizen artist look like? Well, are you, I, a, is, are you a citizen no, artist? Yes, I have a really extreme position on this one. And this is why I should never run for office or ever be allowed to run anything at all. I think like art, and I probably would extend it in a sort of half assed Bauhaus-y kind of way to building things. Like building things is kind of art too, in a way. Mm -hmm. I don't think I'd have any dance. You couldn't do dance or anything like that. But building things generally, and painting and drawing things could all be included. I think just should be compulsory, like national service. I think if every 18 year old had to do like, like being in Israel, like join the, I, you know, the- IDF, IDF. yeah. Yeah, or, or I don't know if they still do it in France, or you can go and like, I don't know, clean fat burgers out of the sewage system with your bare hands, right? So get a choice. A year of like foundation y style art, but proper art, not like you can't just, you know, you can't pretend it's art. It's it's got to involve, it doesn't have to involve like learning amazing skills, but it certainly has to involve learning to look and to, to take apart what you're seeing, mm. which for some people they can do that by drawing, some people they do it by making. It has to be about looking. You know, mm. I went to a college that gets a bad rap for being goldsmiths that you know churned out a bunch of like um, of chances, um, wide boy artists who could kind of talk their way into anything. What they actually did, these rather sincere teachers who were really from the 60s, is constantly try and teach us how to look and also meaning to look at our own work and mm. see what we really have done. You know, we know that from our own families, right? That, the ability to see what you've done is quite complicated. It comes, children feel it. You can see when they rip up their drawing in absolute fury, they can see clearly they've not done what they meant to do. Mm. But to sustain that ability through your life is quite difficult to continue the ability to be able to, to, um, to look. Um, so I think, yeah, I would go further. I would like, I think it would change the world. I think it would be, <laughs> I don't know how you'd enforce it, but that's the problem. It's like my redundant Marxism. It's like the problem is the application of the theory. It's yeah. like the idea is great, but 
I would end up herding people into football stadiums, probably. Right? And on that bombshell. <laughs> <laughs> and breaking their fingers. You know, what are you going to do? It's not easy. <laughs> <laughs> I know it's really not that easy. Thank you ever so much, Liam. I've really enjoyed talking to you. I think that's really wonderful. Thank you. Cheers. I'll see you soon. I will see you soon. <laughs>